believe it or not, fly fishing was the original form of fishing thousands of years ago. But the way they would do it is they would kill an animal and then strip the intestinal lining out, twist it and roll it to make a line. They would find them a stick, any kind of stick from the woods, and then take bones from that animal, put some feathers and fur on it, take more of the intestinal lining and twist it around, throw it into the water, and pull their fish out. So a lot of the streams <laughs> up here are so small, it's the same technique because we'll only have out four feet of line and we're hiking up through these tiny little streams and we might as well be cane pole fishing. <laughs> we're just doing it with a fancier rod. Um, I guess what we're gonna talk about today is, is kind of how to get into fly fishing um, and, and do it affordably so that you're not breaking the, breaking the bank. People will ask, what do I need? Do I need a rod? Do I need waders? You know, what is it that I need? Well, for sure you need a fishing rod and you need a reel because you can't really go without th those two things. Um, you know, by all means, if you've got lots of money, you can go out and get you a, a G Loomis rod here and spend about 400 bucks on it. Um, or if you just want to hop into the sport to see if you like it before you start putting some money into it, you can go for this Cortland rod that you can get from Walmart for about 50 bucks. Okay, these both will catch the same kind of fish, but it, it's not about how much you spend. It's not about the quality of the gear that you get. It's your, it's knowing how to use it. Trout have evolved millions of years in crystal clear streams to evade critters much stealthier than us. Their predators are the great blue herring, the kingfisher, um, the ospreys, um, and so they're constantly like keeping a lookout and they're trying to hide up under rocks to hide from those birds but there still is that thing where people call and they say oh I want to come fly fish with you because you're a girl and I'm like why and I haven't gotten a straight answer but I think that sometimes people feel learning something from a woman is easier we have we have patience you know, because I had moved River Girl from the bakery, the Todd Bakery, into the train depot here, and it had been an outfitter for seven years before I would moved in. And so when I moved River Girl Fishing in here, people were coming in going, can we rent a kayak? And I was like, nope, but I'll take you fishing. Can we rent an inner tube? Nope, but I'll take you fishing. So slowly started getting a couple of boats, a few tubes. I would take them out with a five by eight trailer and then come back and put more people out. And then I just took the money, put it back into the business, put it back into the business. And here we are 16 years later and we've got 30 something kayaks, 15 canoes, uh, 15 bicycles, 200 and something inner tubes. We're doing eco tours now where we float the river and actually talk about the health of the stream, how to tell the health of the stream, how to take care of your water, so you'll see inside the shop here, we have a lot of old shoes hanging from the ceiling. Every one of those shoes came out of the river during a trash cleanup. And so we use these as examples to show people you need proper shoes that grip your feet, not flip flops, Crocs, jelly shoes. And I think there's a pair of high heels up there. Um, you have no idea what people show up in to go down the river. Well, you can have graphite rods, you can have fiberglass rods, you can have bamboo rods. The rods that I sell are rods that I've built and they'll be affordable because I, I want people to be out there doing it. And, and I don't want them to be held back because things are too expensive. And so you can actually buy um, really nice rods and build it yourself if you take a class on how to do it. It's actually not very hard. Um, but that's another affordable way to like get nice equipment is to buy buy the rod, buy the guides, buy the cork, and build it yourself. And you get so much from building your own stuff. You get so much from tying your own flies. And you'll save a lot of money by doing that also. Some folks really like to get into building their own things, tying their own flies, because then they know the quality that was put into it. They know the craftsmanship that was put into it. Some folks, don't care anything about that and they want one that's built for them they want flies that are tied for them and 
sometimes when I spend a lot of time building a really magnificent fly, I don't want a fish to put their gooey mouth on it. So I'll just leave it in my box and be really proud of the fly that I tied. This is, this is all that we have in the shop here. You can go to some fly shops and there'll be walls of them and just thousands of them. But I, I feel like everything that we have here is everything you would need to fish up here in the high country. So the things that trout eat, okay, so we've got like five or six. There's, there's mayflies, there's stoneflies, there's caddisflies, there's helgramites, there's beetles, there's grasshoppers, there's um, salamanders, there's mice. Yeah, I said mice. If a mouse falls in the water and there's a big brown trout waiting there, he just had his filet mignon for the week. You have to think what lives in the environment, what is near the water, what might fall into the water. And so after a hard rain, it, the fishing's typically better. And I think it's because the rain washes a lot of bugs off the trees into the water and then they, they snack. Um, and so I teach my fishermen, it's not as important to become an entomologist use what the fish uses because they didn't go through an entomology class they don't know that they know size shape and color and so if you can look around and see what flies or if you can pick up rocks and look under the rocks and find the nymph version of the fly that's going to be your best bet for matching up to what those fish are eating and you choose this the right um i think color is probably the first thing you would go for and then the size and the shape because if you see yellow flies hatching off and you throw a size 14 which is pretty big but the average size that's hatching off is a size 16 or a size 18 they may not bite your yellow fly because it's not the right size so i always tell my fishermen if you get the right color and they're still not taking it but you see them actively feeding go smaller in your size so i will start the newbies off with three different flies one will be an elk hair caddis because that is um a fly that hatches off pretty regularly around here and it's a dry fly and um you know that would be a good surface fly um but guess what? 80% of trout bite below the surface. Coming to the surface, they really have to be careful of the birds. So they're only going to come up to the surface when they're feeling like filet mignon. Okay? I consider the nymph, or, and this one is called a Helton Creek nymph. It's, a, it's tied in green, but it, uh, it has a bead. But really, any bead head nymph, if you get the right colors, that's going to be your sinker fly. The dry flies are going to be the ones that are going to land on the surface and stay on the surface um, or they need to stay on the surface so whenever you fish a dry fly make sure you dry it off by flying it through the air dry the wings off and let it land on the surface but 80 percent of trout are going to eat these nymphs that are down on the bottom um, this is what i call the tacos the cheeseburgers the chicken fingers this is what they're going to eat on most of the time this is your filet mignon this is your sushi you know um, and then the third one is going to be one of these woolly boogers. So a caddis fly for the top, and you can get it in different colors, and then a beadhead nymph for under the water, and then this is going to be, this would be your filet mignon with the bacon attached to and wrapped around it. So it would imitate a minnow or a sculpin or a darter, um, any type of small fish that's going to be in the stream. Um, so that's going to be a bigger protein source for them. Um, also, I would fish these in deeper pools where you've got plenty of room to let it bounce and roll um, or strip it through the water where that tail will make a swimming, um, a swimming action. I have a guy named Lee who lives here in Todd. He's 82, maybe 83 now. Um, he's still tying as of now. This is his secret fly. It's the pink woolly booger. And for probably six months, I looked at this in his box and he would come in with his flies and I'd go, oh, I want that one, I want this one, I want that one. And I would see this lone pink one in the corner and I'm like, Lee, what are you doing with a pink woolly booger? Woolly boogers imitate fish. 
okay? They're typically tied in green or grays or browns, fishy colors, not pink. And so he said, oh, well, my daughter, who's in her 30s, Nicole, sweet as she can be, has Down syndrome. And she wanted a Barbie fly. So he tied a pink one. I said, Lee, can I take that and, and fish with it? I said, you keep coming in with it and it just, it, it's, it's really curious to me. He says, yeah, he said, I'll tie you up a couple. When nothing else is getting them, the pink woolly booger. Make sure you get a really fluffy tail on it. If it's in the warmer periods, you don't have to have waders. But what I do recommend is having fly fishing boots because they will come with either felt or they will be studded or they will have walnut shells crushed into the soles. Because when you're walking through the stream, it's slippery. So you need to have those protective shoes on. If you're gonna fish during the colder months, you do need a pair of waders. I recommend the waders that will separate from the boots. That way you can wear the boots with neoprene socks during the summer. And then you can put the boots and the waders on during the winter and you don't have to buy two sets of waders or two sets of boots. Um, again, price will vary from waiter to waiter. So I don't feel like you need a pair of $400 Orvis waders, but maybe spend at least 150 or 200 on a pair of medium range waders so that you're not buying the cheap stuff that might um, biodegrade on you quicker, okay? Um, the other thing that will keep us from slipping down out there is the waiting staff. Um, and so this is an Orvis one. This one's probably about 80 bucks. Um, did I spend 80 bucks? No, I traded this. You know, spending 80 bucks on this, it will, um, it will collapse down into sections so you can put it into this little bag, okay? So that's kind of nice. But if you want to save money, you can go out to the woods and buy your own waiting staff, free from, free from nature. Um, you can get a hiking pole. It does the same thing, but you do want to add a tether to it so that you can take it and either attach it to your waders or attach it to you somehow so that while you're fishing, you're not holding on to this, but you have it handy when you need it and you can fish and drag it beside you or you can take it and put it over your shoulder like this and you can wade and fish wade and fish and then if the stream gets slippery you can reach back here and find it pull it off and now you've got a way to hike up through the stream it is also very handy if a bear comes out you can use it for a defense weapon but i haven't had that happen not yet anyways another thing that i recommend that folks have is a lanyard I really like the lanyards because um, this keeps all of your tools out and accessible so you can use them. Okay, so uh, I have this nice fancy one that if you were to purchase it, it would cost you about 200 bucks. Okay, well I am the guide so I've got to have some nice things, right? But I'll show you what my son Finn uses. Paracord with an 88 cent carabiner from Walmart. And on uh, his lanyard, and this is what I recommend every fly fisherman or fisherwoman start off with, is a way to clip the, the fly off um, if, you, if you need to cut, and then a pair of hemostats for getting the hook out of the fish. Um, but this keeps everything out where you can see it. Um, you can purchase a fly fishing bag. Um, I've had this one almost 16 years. It's a William Joseph bag. I think I paid 80 bucks for it. But you could use a fanny pack. You could use a backpack. Um, I like using the packs versus using a vest because the vest has 5 million pockets. And I would forget which pocket I would put stuff in. That's also why I moved to the lanyard system. So everything's out in front so I can quickly access it. Um, but just having a place to put you a first aid kit, to put you some snack bars, to put you some sunscreen, to have some extra materials in there, um, it's nice to have that out there. Um, when purchasing a net, um, try to purchase one that has this rubber meshing and not the nylon meshing. One, the nylon meshing pulls more slime off of the fish, 
And fish are slimy for a reason. They need the slime to be able to move freely through the water. The slime protects them against parasites and bacteria. When you touch them with dry hands, you pull slime off of them and you put them back and you leave them uh, to where they've got to go build that slime coat back up before something gets into their system. Um, but if you use the nylon net, it pulls slime off. But if you use this, it keeps more slime on there. If you wet your hands before touching the fish, it leaves more slime on there. You also don't want to keep a trout out of the water longer than you would want to be held underwater. So really let, let that sink in because trout, um, in fact, some bigger trout, if you pull them in and you keep them out too long, they will just, when you go to put them back in the water, they will just start going belly up. And so the big ones, you really want to protect and keep them in the water as much as you can. The little ones, when I let them go, I think I can hear them go wee sometimes when I let them go. I like to tell all my fishermen, we're going fishing today, right? We're going to catch some. We're going to see some. We're going to miss some. What's most important is that we're out there and we're at least getting to spend time out there doing it. And I took a lady out the other day and she caught one little brown trout and then she missed a big brook trout. But I told her, I said, you should feel good in knowing that that big one actually came up for your fly and you set the hook correctly like you should have. He was just off a little bit. And then he never gave us another try for it. But I said, we saw that fish, you know? I have a lot of people that come fishing and they don't care if we catch a fish at all. They just want to stand in the river and feel the water rush around them. They want to be able to leave the kids at home, leave the wife at home, leave the um, the stresses of everything that's happening, especially right now, and just be out there, you know. The wives want to come and leave the husband at home and leave the kids at home and just stand and let the water flow, flow around. What we have here is a program called Trout in the Classroom that Trout Unlimited does with the middle school and the high school students where they bring um, trout eggs and they let the kids hatch them out and raise them up to a couple of inches and then they let them stock them in the stream. So I go and speak at Trout Unlimited um, groups. So the Rocky River chapter um, for the last four or five years have brought me baby trout each spring so that I can have trout in the um, depot here to show folks what they look like. And then we have Scotty the Hellbender uh, over here also. Um, I worked three years to get an endangered species permit to keep Scotty. Um, specifically to show the fishermen in case they catch a hellbender because hellbenders eat the same thing that the trout do. They might bite a woolly booger. And so when you catch a full-size hellbender two and a half feet long that comes out thrashing, um, I want them to know what that critter is so that they can cut it loose and let it go. But we need the hellbenders out there in the river because they are our aquatic canary in the coal mine and they tell us what the water quality is out there because they absorb everything through their skin. So if you have hellbenders, you know you have healthy water. And you know, I've played with fish my whole life. So it's all I've ever, ever done. Like as a teenager, I had like 10 fish tanks in my room with a water bed. So my father thought that the floor was gonna fall through. And I've just gone with the flow of life and just trying to keep on doing what I've done since I was a kid.